We were herded into uh, to this uh, to this train, you know, cattle. They normally transported cattle, and uh, the, it was in 1944. It was hot in the summer. Doors were shut. It was dark. Then we thought, is this going to be a, a resettlement? And yet we were clinging on to something, something hopeful. I remember that journey I shall never ever forget. 39 hours in a cattle truck, crammed full of people, no food, no water, no sleep. And I remember particularly the sort of stench that built up in this cattle truck. If you could imagine a sort of mixture of human sweat, of vomit, of feces, of urine, all mixed up. The sort of oxygen levels in the cattle truck were dropping. People were gasping for air. And then suddenly this cattle truck stopped and I heard this great sort of rum as the cattle truck door slid open. And I remember particularly well this great waft of ice cold air that came into the cattle truck. <sighs> you know, we could breathe again. It's a bit like you dive into the swimming pool, you know, and you, what you want to do, you want to get to the top. And I could not believe my eyes. I've seen walking skeletons in every sense of the word. Heaps of bodies lying outside each barrack. And I said to myself, I'm not going to die like that. In, in Vestabore, suddenly I'd wandered right up to the perimeter wire without real, realizing it. You can imagine a little eight-year-old in his mind miles away. And suddenly I could go no further. And I looked behind and I realized I'd left the barracks behind and there was a guard looking down at me from a watchtower and about 20 meters away along the perimeter wire were two German guards uh, with a dog and I froze and they unleashed the dog and this dog came running over and bit me all over my arms, my thighs, my chest and my legs and things and I remember these German guards laughing at, at this bit of jew baiting, this eight-year-old being mauled by this dog before they called it off and I ran back to the barracks and there were all these bite marks and all these bleeding from these bite marks. And after that, I became quite streetwise. You know, if I saw guards, keep well away from them. I wanted to die. You know, I, just, I was ready to give up, give up. What changed your mind? Uh, well, I did uh, crawl out, I couldn't walk. I crawled out in the open and uh, I was, uh, I, uh, I lost my, um, I wasn't conscious anymore. I was just moving a little bit. And what changed my mind was this helpfulness. Somebody picks me up and it wasn't an aggressive way, but gently picked me up and placed me in, in a small little ambulance. And who was that who, who picked you up? A soldier. A soldier, and I thought, gosh, you mean kindness still survived? The British troops were most fantastic. There are no words to express. They installed water, they brought the food, and then asked me why I look camp is in such a terrible state. So I told them there's no water, there's no food, a typhus epidemic, dysentery. All diseases were very rife and people were dying like flies in their hundreds. 500 per night, can you imagine? When I watched the television sometimes, you know, showing camps and so on, I go like that. I touch myself, am I really alive? And I was there, and I got through all that. It's, and I'm thankful to God that I'm here, able to tell that story. If you just bear in mind that of the 15,000 children that went to Theresienstadt, just 93 of us survived. And I'm one of them. And I find it is so important that I tell my story to schools. I mean, I've now given over 800 talks in schools all over the country. And I always end my, 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 my talk by saying I dedicate this, this story to all those children who never came home.